Hello, my name is Deborah Dwork, and I am the director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth event in a year-long virtual series on the subject of refugees and forcibly displaced persons. Offered in the midst of a global refugee crisis, our series examines historical and contemporary cases to lay bare underlying patterns, illuminate unknown aspects, and suggest paths forward. Our subject was never more urgent than now. Many of us saw the mayhem of the August 20, 2021 Kabul airport evacuations and the despair of people desperately seeking safety. We are witness today to the mayhem of Russian destroyed civilian life in Ukraine and the despair of women, children, the ill and the elderly more than 3.5 million persons desperately seeking safety across the country's Western borders and twice that number internally displaced. This semester, we investigate the meaning of home. We began with an examination of the prompts for and problems of repatriation. Today, we look at resettlement, the arduous process of putting down roots in a new land, a new culture. We are fortunate to have five perspectives on the subject of Afghan resettlement in Rochester. I will introduce everyone now, and then we will proceed to our discussion. Please note, we will have a question and answer period so please pose questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now for the introductions in the order in which they will speak. Nabila Kadiri Kohistani came to Rochester in 2019 with 10 years of experience working in a number of national and international organizations for women's empowerment, capacity building, gender mainstreaming, and to strengthen civil society. Among her many achievements in her last position was to create a sexual harassment policy for the Ministry of Education to decrease violence against and harassment of women. Since resettlement in Rochester, Nabila has served as a volunteer for keeping our promise, helping new immigrants secure and attend medical appointments, interpreting whenever and wherever needed, and smoothing the disjunction of cultural adjustment. Mir Aniatullah Mosawi lived in Afghan's capital city of Kabul. Mir worked for the US Army Corps of Engineers from 2010 to 2016. In late 2015, one of his supervisors at the Corps of Engineers provided him with a letter of recommendation. With this, Mir applied for a special immigrant visa or SIV, which grants permanent residence to people who aid the US government abroad. According to the law that established the SIV, the entire process should take no more than nine months. But should is the operant word. This is an arduous process, even with a golden recommendation. And indeed, it took near almost four years. He was issued an SIV in February, 2019, and he and his wife came to the United States. Mir has been working for an electrical company 
C.M. Armitage since he arrived in Rochester. Ellen Smith serves as the executive director of Keeping Our Promise, also called KOP, which means that Ellen does everything. She educates people about the wartime ally program, writes grants, looks for housing for KOP's clients, and raises funds to keep the operation afloat. She has helped over 600 SIV refugees and their families since 2014. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, Ellen was selected by the National Council of Jewish Women Greater Rochester Section to receive the 2019 Hannah G. Solomon Humanitarian Award. And she was honored with the Spirit of America Award by the Reserve Officers Association for creating a welcoming community for those who served our country. Obaja Omar is the health case manager in the Refugee Resettlement Office of Catholic Charities Family, Charity Family and Community Services in Rochester. Obaida works with complex medical cases and helps refugee families access resources within the Rochester community. Obaida was born in Afghanistan. She was 12 when she and her family immigrated to the United States. She understands the struggles of the resettlement process and is dedicated to making the transition easier for newly arrived refugees. This shaped her choice of career and her involvement with a number of outreach programs that help settle refugees in the community. And finally, David Silver is a committed volunteer. David enjoyed a mission-driven career in Rochester's public education sector, serving as associate superintendent of Rochester City School District and as the visionary who shaped Rochester's School of the Arts. He then turned to equally meaningful volunteer work, which included a synagogue committee that finds housing for families in need of emergency shelter. A fellow member of that committee was active in No One Left Behind, the predecessor organization to Keeping Our Promise, and introduced David to it. The mission resonated. As he explained, for him, the Holocaust is constantly present. And I quote his words. The stories of the world shutting its door to Jews fleeing Nazi atrocities reverberate in my mind. How could I not be a part of opening the door to refugees? It is my responsibility and my honor to open the door. With that, we turn to Nabila to begin our round table. And please, everyone, do pose questions through the Q&A function. Nabila, you came to Rochester in 2019 with a special immigration visa. Would you tell us first about your work in Afghanistan and how you secured the SIV? What was that process? And what were the key factors or turning points that helped you to be successful. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, everyone. As Ms. Deborah mentioned, this is Nabila. I have come to Rochester on my special immigration visa after nine years of working for the gender equality, women's empowerment, and women's capacity building through USAID funded projects back in Afghanistan and were busy to serve for the women in 28 provinces of Afghanistan. 
During these nine years, I have worked with 3,500 Afghan women to establish entrepreneurship and their own small businesses. And as a part of Afghanistan's biggest gender equality project named uh, Promote, through its uh, WLD component, I have worked with 2,525,000 uh, young university graduate and school students in two components as a direct and indirect, or we can call primary and secondary groups, where we enable these young girls to learn the management and leadership skills and the life skills through this, uh, during their school years. And also I have helped the gender department uh, and Ministry of Education to establish their sexual harassment policy for the very first time. And through this policy, uh, they become enabled to uh, generate the harassment reporting policy and the harassment case investigation community in the Ministry of Education back in Afghanistan, which they didn't have. And even if anything were happening in school level, there was no reporting system, there was no community to investigate, and even people were not feeling comfortable to report such cases. So I became uh, uh, able to establish that policy, which were really useful during the past few years back in Afghanistan. And also I have worked for the economic empowerment of women in 28 provinces, those women who has lost their head of household and they didn't have any male to earn income. So I have helped them through the ACAPTO project, the Afghan Civilian Assistance Project to establish their income generation sources. These were the work that I have done. And finally, when the risk of targeting women workers of USID or foreign uh, NGOs, uh, the supervisor provided the recommendation letter and I have applied for uh, the special immigration visa, which took almost 18 months for me to be done with the process and, five, and seven steps, which were approval and the document submission and finally getting the visa and coming, uh, coming to the United States. So here I have been welcomed by QP and did the uh, resettlement in Rochester. And recently I'm, work, I'm going to start my work for the Department of Education in Rochester and the uh, City School District as a paraprofessional. So that's all what I have done and what I'm doing, hopefully to serve for those uh, refugees who are coming through the OSS school to get, um, to move with their higher education. This is what I'm responsible to help them to move further higher education as per their diploma and degrees, and also who wanted to work to help them and connect them with the working agencies here. Thank, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And Mir, please answer the same question. You too came to Rochester in 2019 with an SIV. Would you tell us about your work in Afghanistan and how you secured the SIV? What was that process? What were the key factors or turning points that helped you to be successful? Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful that I have found this opportunity to speak my experience. Yes, that's right. I have come to Rochester in 2019, um, but the story of my journey starts from 2010. Uh, back then in Afghanistan, I had have I had have a very strong belief that our government and you, uh, with the support of U.S. and coalition force, um, will rebuild this uh, infrastructure of our country and also bring a bright future for our nation. With that aim and belief, I was very eager to join uh, or to take part. 
uh, fortunately, I have found the opportunity to start working with US Army Corps of Engineers in 2010. Uh, the core mission of US Army Corps of Engineers were to build bases, military bases for Afghan National Police and Afghan National Army. Uh, so we, uh, when I joined with them, we, they had a lot of biggest project and we have established a very good uh, relation with Afghan National Police and US Army Afghan, and also US Coalition Force. We have built a massive uh, military bases for Afghan National Army and uh, through the years of 2010 up to 2016. On 2015, uh, the talks were uh, raised uh, uh, about regarding withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan and the situation it took, uh, like the situation turned very critical. So I, I, I started looking for an option. Uh, then on that time, that was 2015, late 2015, that I, through the research that I have did, I found a special immigrant visa. I have asked my U.S. supervisors uh, that I were in, I was in contact with them through the years to support my application, and fortunately, man, many of them uh, uh, accepted to support my case. Uh, 2016, beginning 2016. We gathered all those documents that is necessary for first step of USIV and, um, and submitted for, uh, for consideration. Uh, after, after a long period of waiting time, uh, almost one year, I have received the denial, <laughs> denial letter from the, uh, the National Visa Center. And the denial letter came with a shocking surprise for me. Uh, I believe that I worked for a uh, US Army and I deserve this. So I, I tried to appeal the decision with, with support of my US supervisors. And also uh, I have found a nonprofit US-based uh, organization that they call themselves IRAP, International, Refu uh, International Refugee Assistance Program. I have made contact with them, with work, with support of my US supervisors. So we could, we could finally we could come over with denial and got a positive result. Uh, USIV is a, a special as is a special immigrant visa. It's a very lengthy for it's, it depends for everyone. For me, it was a lengthy process. It requires tons of uh, tons of documents um, and a lot of supporting documents, a screening, especially when you work with US Army. Uh, engineering division, they need a lot of screening and you have to go through all those screening and you have to pass those screening in order to get issue a visa. Finally, after almost four years, on 2019, I got the issuance, uh, I got the message from them that my visa and my wife visa were issued. So we got the visa. Once you get your visa, then uh, there's another challenge on, on the head that you have to arrange your flight from Afghanistan to United States. Uh, of course, there's another organization, it's called IMO, uh, International Immigrant Organization, that they are responsible for your loan and travel arrangement, but you have to go through the waiting list that they have. There's people that they are waiting and you have to wait also. But fortunately, through social media and uh, through social media, I have found uh, I made contact with Miss Ellen and uh, through another program, nonprofit uh, government uh, as Miles for Immigrant. They were able to, to just act promptly and uh, arrange my, my travel arrangement. So after travel, after I got my tickets, here we are. I am here. Thank you so much. And that's a perfect, a perfect lead off to Ellen. So Ellen, please explain how your organization, Keeping Our Promise, how does it intersect with SIV holders such as Mia and Nabila? How do you connect? At what point do you get involved? And what does KOP aim to achieve with each refugee? 
So thank you, Deborah, and everyone for inviting me. Um, you know, we've connected with SIV holders in several ways over the years. And in the case of Nabila, she happened to know the very first SIV we helped in Rochester, New York, Aziz, who is now a proud US citizen and homeowner in Rochester. So um, Nabila was quite lucky that um, she had that Rochester connection. Um, Mira Nayat was on a Facebook group when he was still in Afghanistan. And in fact, I was on vacation and, and glowing in the fact that I had a day off and I didn't have to do anything. And I get this message from Mir saying, can you help me? And I said, can it wait two weeks? <laughs> so, um, but of course it can't wait two weeks, right? I, these are life and death situations for our families. And um, I want to tell everyone that on my office wall, um, I have the photographs of six uh, SIV applicants who have died, who died and were killed by the Taliban in Afghanistan, waiting for their visas as we tried to help them get to the US. And um, I promised the very first who died, um, uh, Kadir, that I would do my best that no one would die again waiting for a visa. So. Um, I want to tell you that for all the faults of Facebook, it is in fact the way that we connect with many of our Afghan friends and through Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, which is also a Facebook um, platform. And I, you know, people don't realize that. So that's really important. Um, we also, we get referrals from people in the military. Um, the very first family I helped was in Syracuse, New York actually the first two families. And they came through a US Army Captain, Michael Chapel, And he was simply looking to help furnish apartments. He was gonna find the apartments and he just needed help. At the time I was a reporter with lots of sources and resources. And I said, absolutely, I will help. I'm 90 minutes away, I have a farm, I can collect furniture. And so I reached out to help this Army Captain um, in Western New York and that's how Really, it's how we it started. Um, so, if and we we get a lot of Afghans also who ask, well, where should I resettle? And some of our more recent families did not have connections with uh, Rochester, but they've heard of keeping our promise. And I just say, you know, um, this is reality in in Western New York near the Canadian border in Lake Ontario. Um, you have to put up with a lot of snow, an average of 120 inches a year, really cold winters uh, down to wind chills of maybe minus 30 on those last two weeks of January and beginning of February. We've all been through that. Um, but you know, we have warm hearts here and we really seek, um, it was my goal to make this a, a premier and a model resettlement program for the country. Um, in terms of our goals, I, you just need to realize with each family, it's very specific. Um, Anayat and Nabila um, were very well educated. It was easier for them than say, the people who were the housekeepers or warehouse people at our military bases who speak no English. You know, they're, they're Dari and English speakers. And they have to learn some English and it's a lot harder for them. But I have to tell you that um, my ultimate goal is that we have a very great and wonderful program in New York State called the First Time Home Buyers Program. And what I want is to create a very good foundation for every family to be able to succeed, you know, get an education, succeed, and with the ultimate goal of buying a home um, in Western New York. And it's, it's a great family place to be. I came up from Washington, DC, and I remember just feeling out of sorts moving from Washington to here. And, but the community in Rochester is fantastic. And I think that, that we can create the meaning of home here in New York. And I've actually had Afghans tell me when they're at their picnics and parties that this is, this is like home for them. 
And, and that's our goal is to create a, a safe and welcoming community for our Afghan friends and allies. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Obaida, not all refugees who are resettled in Rochester hold SIVs. Please tell us about the Catholic Charities Family and Community Services Settlement Process of those who do not. And please tell us about you. Hi, thanks, Devorah. And it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me today. Um, so imagine, you know, uh, coming to a strange land and not knowing the language, the culture, the food, right? And how, how would you feel? So leaving everything behind, living in a refugee camp, five to 20 years. So these are really a refugees. And so when refugee process starts, um, you know, overseas, it's, it's a, the vetting process is really tedious. Um, and they don't just sit on the plane, you know, as a lot of us don't know refugees, they say they just sit on the plane and get here, right? So it, as Nabila and um, uh, Mir just stated as well, it took 18 months, right? To almost two years, the process takes. So they go through all this uh, back at home check by FBI, CIA and all that for them in order to get here. And then once, uh, once they get here, so um, a Catholic um, family, it used to be Catholic family center. So I'm used to saying Catholic family center still. We just merged with Catholic charity. So now we're Catholic family center community service. So we became uh, bigger now. Um, so this was the only agency in Rochester that we settled um, refugees for over hundred years. And just, just recently, as of January, now we have World Relief that opened their office as well. So we have another organization that's going to be resettling. Um, so the process is such, so once we get, uh, so in, uh, at Catholic Charities now, so we have immigration program, we have um, the resettlement program, we have the preferred communities, which I am the manager of that program for medical um, cases, and as well as interpreting and employment. So once they get here, we go to the airport. And of course, Ellen is my best friend at the airport. I see her last few months, you know, almost midnight. You know, we go in the airport, we have parties there. Um, so, so then the, the, so the refugees will get here. So then we'll go to the airport, we'll welcome them and we make sure um, that the housing is set up for them. Um, and then for 90 days, so the resettlement case manager would work with them on the core services, basically making sure that they're connected to DHS, uh, social security, um, registration for school. And so, and then every person gets $1,025 for their resettlement fund because DHS takes about 45 days for the cases to open for the temporary assistant for them to receive. So they, they will utilize that money for the first month to get, you know, to pay for their first month rent deposit and all that. Um, and of course, you know, so there's a bit different with SIVs because there comes, you know, the KOP organization. So they get that additional support, which is really, really wonderful. You know, I've been working very closely with Alan and she's a wonderful person, passionate, you know, working uh, with, with other refugees too. She has been helping me. But it really helps when you have organization, you know, in the community, um, you know, like our, we can't do our job with our partners, um, so that you know, the, so that the resettlement process is successful, um, and of course, uh, self sufficiency, and that's the goal of the resettlement agency. But yet, ninety days is not enough for them to, you know, learn English and become self sufficient. So they're going to need extended help for more duration. And so there we have. Uh, post resettlement now, case management as well, because the 90 days is not enough, as I said earlier. Um, so, so having partners, and we have a great community in Rochester uh, for our refugees when they come here. And you know, why do they come here? Yes, some might have families, and also the, um, the cost of living is much cheaper compared to uh, you know the other larger cities. Thank you, Obaida. Thank you so much. Okay. That opens the door. If 90 days are not enough, they need, refugees need support. And here we go, the volunteer. So David, organizations do amazing work, but they cannot do everything. Volunteers complement the resettlement process. Could you tell us about the volunteering initiative you joined? 
What do volunteers undertake to do? What is your own experience? Well, good evening, everyone. I think a good volunteer has to be very compassionate, patient, and gentle. In essence, they're working with people who are traumatized, unsure of who they can trust, and from a vastly different culture. They come from a place where gender and age define status, respect, responsibilities, and daily functions. The families I have met have a life that from many perspectives coexist in the 17th century and our modern era at the same time. For example, people have cell phones and computers, but currently do not let women travel alone. The volunteer has to help navigate and negotiate life in our culture. In many ways, the new arrivals need exposure to and familiarity with our manners, customs, laws, and traditions. But at the same time, a volunteer must show deep respect for the manners, customs, laws, and traditions of the refugee. It's not my mission to change anyone. Rather, I hope to help my new friends become both bilingual and bicultural, to help them not just survive, but thrive in this new land. As the grandchild of immigrants, I know that the children of these refugees will naturally become fluent in bilingual and bicultural arenas, and that their children may not even speak Dari or Pashto. Much will change in a very short time. It's my hope that they will always be proud to be Afghani American. David, could you just tell us a little bit about your, about your own experience? How did you meet Mia, for example? Um, one of the, uh, Ellen, <clears throat> Ellen is, uh, sits at the head of uh, a, a great group of people who form her board and her board has worked miracles in uh, dividing the volunteers into circles that surround different people as they come, new people. And as um, uh, Obida said, help them for more than the, the nine months perhaps as, as they stay. And uh, we were given a family and unfortunately, um, <clears throat> After the nine months and then one year and then two years, uh, we didn't atrophy away and take new people. We stayed and adopted this family and they are now our family. And our family has become so much richer because we have taken in and become part of their friends as well. And so Mir and Nabila and uh, a number of the friends of my family are now my family too, and my family as well. So it's been, it's been such a joy and so rich for us to meet these great people and to have them become part of who we are. Thank you. Do you wanna say anything about what you actually do with the families you adopt? So that we have a better sense practically of what volunteers What's involved? Well, in that um, navigate and negotiate kind of phrase, um, in the beginning, it's um, very, uh, very, very essential and basic skills, such as taking someone to the doctor, finding a dentist, um, helping them um, pay for that dentist or find out how to pay for that dentist. They get letters from the government with which, um, with my ability to read and interpret, I have tremendous problems with. So I can't imagine trying to understand these, these documents that they get. So it's helping them navigate through things like that as, as they um, then become uh, ready for step two. For example, I, I taught my, um, my new family member how to drive. And uh, subsequently, Ellen got him a car. Um, so in the beginning, it may be how to take buses and get from your home to a place of employment or education, but then it turns into driving lessons. And then it turns into hosting dinners for each other. 
And when that happens and the uh, warmth and security and uh, comfort increases, people let down their guards more and more and say, you know, I'm having a problem with this or I'm having a problem with that. There are certain things that um, you may want to go to, not just a doctor, but a specialist. Um, and it, at this point, it's very critical for both members of the family, myself and my wife, to become part of this because sometimes women are much more comfortable only speaking to women or men only speaking to men about what needs they may have. And those needs get uh, very intimate and very personal. And so you become very, very close with these people. You start to really care about the many people they're missing at home and worry about their parents uh, or their siblings and try to help them also come and become part of the American dream. So that, that actually is a perfect introduction to round two, which is about the complexities of forced displacement. It's, to, it's very difficult. And in addition to the opportunities, there's also negotiating difficulty and negotiating loss. So Nabila, we're back to you. And my question to you is that papers are key to leaving and they are key to situating oneself in a new land. Could you please speak about the problem of obtaining and transmitting documents? And a second, perhaps related question is the rocky path to professional recertification. You alluded to this a little bit, in your in round one, and I wonder if you could elaborate. Thank you, Deborah. Actually, as you mentioned, and also Obaida and Mr. David, they also mentioned during their first questions. Uh, when you are coming from another country, like everything is totally getting to a different stage into a different shape. And it is really hard to deal with every single things. And one of them is the documentation, especially the education documents. It's totally different from for each immigrant who is coming from the country. And from I'm talking from my own experience and from the experience that I have learned from the around people. When we are coming, there are some challenges. Uh, uh, first of all, like the length of the documentation, a document certification back in Afghanistan and the language barrier. Sometimes you cannot get the document properly translated to the English. And uh, sometimes you cannot even get your documents because when you, you are, uh, the embassy is granting you visa, they give you like 15 days to move from the country. And in 15 days, you, uh, you cannot like do the process of getting the documents. If you get and if you bring uh, at least with a document with a transcript or a degree from your country, sometimes it is not translated. This is the first challenges. The, when we come here, the other thing is the, uh, in the New York State, you have to be a resident for an year in order to move with your higher education, which we are lucky that QP is in a kind of deal with the, uh, to find a solution for this, uh, this area, like they were, they're working to, uh, to do some, uh, some uh, thing in order to decrease the uh, time barrier of one year re residency in order like some people who are coming from the country they are uh, they are like fluent in English and they are ready to move forward with their bachelor degree or with their master degree so they don't have to wait for the one year residency and one year they will get to the second uh, year of master degree so we are lucky to have QP and land to work for this issue and the other thing is the uh, some of like uh, even our masters back there in Afghanistan, they're not fluent in English. So uh, 
as I have joined, uh, as I have said, what the uh, OS says, the audit uh, learning uh, language learning center through school district. This was the focus uh, focusing area that the people who has the education and the practical experience, but they don't have language skill, how to help them, and also the. Um, the other thing is that there is, uh, we are working and I have to work with the group of uh, like the Catholic Family Center or the World Relief that they have to uh, include the uh, higher education uh, procedures in New York State as a part of very welcoming package to the refugees because they are really willing to continue with and give their higher education degrees, but they're not familiar with how to move with the degree evaluation, how to move with the, uh, like where to go, where to get start. So uh, this is something that we are working. Hopefully everything will get to the uh, solution point and we will have everything on the packages. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Mia, family, everyone leaves family behind. Would you please tell us about your family, their situation and your worries? Thank you, Deborah. No, it's, uh, it's really a hard question and to answer this one. Uh, as an immigrant, I understand that when you move to a new place, there is basic challenges, the daily challenges. Like if you think about daily routines, it's a challenge for you. You are in a new place. You have different problems and different challenges. That's why um, existence of a nonprofit government, nonprofit organization like Keeping Up Our Promise, uh, and also agencies like Catholic Family Center, it's uh, it's appreciable present, presence, uh, presence of these organizations. So they can help with you when you're here. They can just welcome you on air, uh, airport and help you with your basic routines, uh, lifestyle in United States, everything. And uh, day by day, you can come over with all those challenges. This is This is common. When you move to a new place, this is common. But the actual um, challenge that I think as a migrant, and uh, I know uh, most of the people that they are here as and they are in the United States through a special immigrant or through asylum seeker, refugees, uh, or the type of visa that United States has, all of them, most of them that I have talked with them, they have uh, biggest challenge, and I call it like it's emotional or maybe the emotional challenge emotional by emotional challenge i mean that the family that they have back there the situation is getting worse day by day you can't explain what's going on over there you can't you can't be sure of their safety day by day they have restrictions day by day they have uh, new rules even you cannot you cannot represent your present appearance. You have restrictions on every day. Every day that you see the news, you see a new ban, a new uh, restrictions on life, on lifestyle, on freedom, on freedom of the speech. And uh, whenever you wanna talk about something, about the truth, you get haunted by them. The regime that they're over there, they don't allow the people, neither they don't allow you to have freedom, uh, they don't allow you nowadays to travel, to flee from Afghanistan. That's really a biggest problem that we all have common. So the family that they are back there every day, that when you talk with them and you see that they are suffering day by day, the situation is getting worse, they don't have food, and they are talking about the neighbors, that the neighbors are selling their kids to feed the rest of them, that's really painful for us. And uh, this uh, torture you day by day, every day. It remains in your mind. If you go to the work, you just think about this issue. If you are in family in here, you can't be relaxed all the time. It's been since the crisis that happened in Afghanistan. This is the subject among all of the families in here. They are talking about the families that they are back there. So the solution that uh, recently provided by the United States humanitarian parole, that's the biggest hope for all of Afghans that they are here. I hope they can pave the way 
for the families to be reunited and uh, simplify the process. Uh, we heard, I heard, actually, I heard a very good news that United States is uh, referring cases, United uh, humanitarian parole cases to Canada. I hope that goes well and looking forward to reunite with the families that they are over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Obaida, oh, you too are a resettled refugee. So would you elaborate on the challenges of living in a new culture, especially without extended family or friends? Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to David as well, because without the volunteers, oh my God, it's impossible. And you guys do an amazing job. Um, yes, for me, um, so as a young child, um, you know, uh, going through the war and witnessing so many people losing their lives. Um, so myself coming as a, you know, as a refugee, I know firsthand what it is like to be a refugee. It is not an easy task. So um, during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, I was six years old when I left Afghanistan. And we walked through the mountains um, to get into the neighboring country, Pakistan, Peshawar. Um, and lived, um, I lived with my family in the refugee camp uh, for about six years. And a refugee camp life is not easy as, as well. And as a child, it's really confusing. There's no running water, there's no education, there's no proper food. So I lost all my childhood. And then um, at an age, sorry, when I talk about that, I become emotional. <laughs> and so then at age uh, um, 12, 13, I came to the US. Um, you know, as a refugee. And I landed in Boston, Massachusetts. That's my hometown. And I was welcomed just like, just like you, David, volunteers from churches, church world service. Um, so people like you, you know, really empowered me and supported my family. And so I was able to go to high school. I did not speak a word of English when I came to the U.S., First year was challenging. I went to high school and slept through the class because <laughs> I didn't know what the teacher was saying. But I had to work really, really hard. I used to watch Sesame Street, I remember, every single day just so that I can learn the language. Um, and you know, and, and after, uh, after three years, I graduated from high school. I didn't have to go to the fourth year I, you know, because I was going to summer school and all that. Um, so we worked very hard. And then I got married. Of course, now um, I have three children. Then after my three children, I decided to go back to college. I was like, no, I have to get my degree. And my younger son has autism. So my passion was to help others. And I went and got my degree as social worker. And, and, you know, and, and that was my other thing to go back, give back to the community, work with refugee population. And I ended up at the, you know, at the Catholic Charities, which I love, I love what I do because I know what it is like. And so when these families come, as uh, Nabila and Mira saying, it is very difficult, the trauma that they have endured, right? The families that they have left behind. In the situation right now uh, in Afghanistan, it is, it is heartbreaking to see, you know, like the families are broken up. So the influx of Afghans that has been coming since October of 2021, I've been working 12 hours a day because the needs are so much. And these families, they left everything behind, right? And they come, they start from zero. But as Alan stated, within like two, three years, they work extremely hard. I think the jobs that others would not take, but refugees would. So, you know, they give back to the community. But with, you know, temporarily, yes, they'll need support. They'll need to go to DHS temporarily to get supported. But once they stand on their feet, they work. They get two, three jobs. I have families that I can tell you so many stories, you know, that they have bought houses. And also one more thing I wanted to say is that Taliban does not equal Islam. Of course not. Thank you, but thank you for saying, for saying it directly. Ellen, resettlement work prizes self-sufficiency. Can you tell us how that is achieved and what is gained and what is lost? when self-sufficiency is a dominant goal? Um, so first of all, I just want to challenge one thing Obita said, and that is she works 12 hours. 
<laughs> because I'm going, I'm here to witness that I have seen this woman work 16 and 18 hours and, and we've both functioned on very little sleep. And um, please recognize that um, as partners, like she works incredibly hard. And I just want to point that out. Um, you know, self-sufficiency is this American goal, but um, there is this myth in America of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And I am here to say, as, as a person who grew up with a mattress on a bare floor and a light bulb uh, hanging from the ceiling with a cord, you know, you really need help. It, it, it's, and we see this in the extreme poverty in Rochester, New York. I mean, we are a city of extreme poverty um, and extreme wealth. And the bottom line is you, you need help. You're not going to do it alone. And, and I'm sorry, I don't care what anyone says, but, um, and, and I like to take an example of a couple arriving with nothing. They don't know the language. You know, the guy, he's, he's worked with American troops. He thinks he knows American customs, but he doesn't really know them. And, um, and, you know, a lot of the wives, just because of the situation in Afghanistan, they've, they've not been around men or, driving, for instance, um, or, you know, being told, well, you have to take the bus to English classes, right? But they weren't even allowed out of their home without a male. So, so there's a lot we expect. Um, and, and so I just, I want to break this myth of self-sufficiency. Um, there, the other problem is we do need some basic level of English. And we've had combat interpreters who speak very well, but then when they're tested, they may test only at a, at a second grade level in written English, right? Um, and so it, it's hard to find work if you can't pass a proficiency exam or test that the employer wants to give. And another thing that I found is we went to our local pasta factory. They're desperate for work. You know, we grow all this wheat up here in upstate New York. It's a great job. It was great pay. But guess what? They didn't know quarts and gallons. They knew liters. They don't know. They know centimeters or meters. They don't know feet and inches, right? So we have employers that want to employ our guys, but, but our families aren't familiar with, with things like US measurements, right? And why we haven't switched to metric is like beyond me. But, and there's other things like to get a job, you need OSHA 40 hour safety training, right? But, and they may understand some, but not all. So one of the things we're working on is getting some manuals translated into Pashto and Dari, right? So our families can understand. So not just OSHA manuals, but also the New York State driving manual, which is in 13 languages, but not Pashto or Dari. So um, it is difficult and, and please just bust the myth on the self-sufficiency thing, because it, it's not true. The other thing I want to touch on is what, is what um, Nabila mentioned, which is this one-year residency, because we do have people who started um, college at Kabul University, maybe they didn't finish or all their, um, all their experience or credits may not transfer into our system. But in New York, they require, our state requires one year of residency before you can go into some training programs. And this is true with skilled trades and with our, our community college system or our SUNY system. So I have been working for four years and I think we're getting closer to passing a law that will allow SIVs, I would like it for all refugees to be considered a resident upon arrival in our cities, not just Rochester, wherever they may go, Syracuse, Buffalo, Westchester County, um, but that's not the case right now. It's really important, Colorado did this, California did this, and New York needs to do this. Another issue for our, re our region and in terms of self-sufficiency is you need a car. We are upstate New York, we have snow. Our bus system is noted in several federal studies as being one of the worst public transportation systems in the entire nation. Our families need cars. Without those cars, 
they're just not going to get ahead in life. They can't get to the better jobs in the suburbs. So we have a Wheels for Work program. The grants are four to $5,000 per family to get a vehicle. That has to include insurance. They may have to kick in some of their welcome money, which was mentioned, they get $1,025 each. Um, but, but that vehicle is necessary to get them to self-sufficiency. And again, I wanna bring up that our goal is to create this foundation. So hopefully one day they will have home ownership. In this region of Western New York, we still have some of the lower um, home, home prices in the nation. And, and, and actually it costs more to rent than it does to own a home. So we really wanna get folks into the New York State First Home Buyers Program which is New York State will match. They, they save $100 for 18 months and New York State will match that and pay for closing costs. I want them in that program. Um, but you know, to start, they need a foundation of English and proficiency up to at least the sixth grade level and they need a car. And these are just necessary things to, to become self-sufficient, at least in our region. Thank you. And I'm happy to kick self-sufficiency to the curb. I agree with you. It is a, it is a myth, but it's a myth that, I would, that I'm very glad that you took on directly. So David, many people have suggested that refugees take from the system. You and all, everyone on the panel, has seen and suggested ways in which refugees give back. Could you talk about that? Yeah, to answer that question, I wanna borrow some thoughts inspired by Griffin Jackson, who's a former editor from the Chicago Tribune. Refugees are mothers and fathers, they're children and friends, they're plumbers and engineers and computer analysts and cooks. They're hoping to rebuild their careers they had in their home countries before they were forced to leave. In their country, they have saints and they have sinners. They have rich and poor, educated and uneducated. Some are religious and some play soccer and some like jazz. But they all believe in the American dream. Refugees tend to reinforce a deep commitment to many values that we often praise but gloss over, for example, the importance of family, community, loyalty, modesty, humility, honor, sacrifice. Through refugees, we're introduced to new cultures and new worlds. We become students. We learn the magnificent variety in man's religion, politics, cultures, and life experiences. Refugees bring new outside the box thinking to our worldview. They are social innovators. Our space systems, current research centers, and universities are meccas for the best scholars, researchers, and scientists of the world. Our palettes would be blander, our music duller, our knowledge dimmer, our products less powerful, and our education less affecting, our world less explored, were it not for refugees who are given a chance an opportunity to flourish. Each of us, each of us is a product of a refugee somewhere in our family tree. The American identity, insight, and creati creativity come from this magnificent stew. Refugees keep the culture fresh and growing and make our world a much more beautiful and constantly new an exciting place in which to live. Thank you. So that concludes the second round, round two. And now we turn to questions. And there are a couple of questions from the audience, which I will ask you to respond to answer. And, um, and then we'll do our lightning last round. So, I, there was a question that just went away. Um, Nabila, did you deal with that? Hi, and yes. Actually, there oh. was a question asking how we would like to help the 
refugees regarding like the education awareness, like you have to provide them brochures or what? So I would like to answer the question that I love to, uh, I love that from the very beginning when a refugee came to the US, the their education, they have to be uh, asked about their education level, they have to be asked for their future education plan, and they have to be uh, uh, provided with the awareness or the informative uh, brochures or any guideline uh, if we established that's how they can move with their plan like when they come we educate them how to move with their snap like food stamp how to move with their uh, energy bills or how to pay the rent or how to deal with the dhs so we have to educate them on how to move with their education plan and how they can start from where they left. So it has to be in the very beginning, include in the very beginning package when they move to the US. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ellen, I see that you will answer a question posed by Yanis Tsligakis. Are there data on how much the US government's federal, state and local are spending per resettled refugee? Yeah, so we actually, I, I worked with the Farish Foundation when we did a Wheels for Work card grant program. And um, I don't have the actual numbers because I can't include the employees for like the DHS system, right? I don't know how much employee time there is on benefits. What I can tell you is what a refugee receives is very little. So a single person in, in our area, I don't know what it is for other counties, but they only receive $440 per individual for rent and utilities, okay? A, a, a couple gets $589 a month and um, a family of three gets $732 a month. A family of four gets like 875 a month. This has to include their rent and their utilities. It's, it's not a lot of money. So we have to help them get on their feet or on a path to self-sufficiency as quickly as possible. There was one other question though that I'd like to address and that is what's, you know, the fact that agencies like Catholic Family Center, Catholic Family Services, our, our group, decides what's needed and how money is spent and this really needs to be addressed and that is because first of all when our afghan friends come here or other refugees and you say oh well you can get a job you're going to make 13 dollars an hour and they go oh great i can survive on that and you have to say no you can't right it, it's not a lot of money so I, I understand that there might be this view of patriarchy and how we determine how money is spent, but that's important is that that they may not understand just how expensive things are, and especially up here when it comes to heat, and they've got their heat up to 80, and I have to stand back and say, well, wait until they get their first utility bill, and then they'll, they have to figure it out, right? Um, but um, the, the other issue that I would like people to understand is we cannot give cash, and this was part of this question, we can't give cash to a family. And the reason is when we became a not-for-profit, we had to tell the federal government how we were going to assure that monies would not go to terrorist organizations overseas. So we have to account for everything that we give to a family, we need to account for it. So no, I don't give them $400 for price right for groceries, you know, to start off their life. I have to give them a gift card that they can only spend at this store because I have to assure how this money is being spent and that it is not going to fund terrorist activities. Now, this offends some people because they're like, well, my family is not terrorist. You know that we've passed these security background checks, and I understand that. But this is what we had to do to become a not-for-profit. So, you know, we had to make these assurances to the federal government. 
So, so that's why it gets tricky. There was a very good article today on how it's better to give money to the folks in the Ukraine than to pile up clothes and try to ship clothes over. And, and I understand that, but these are just some of the, the um, uh, problems uh, or barriers we face as a not-for-profit and why we can't give families cash to spend, although they, they do get the welcome money uh, that Obida mentioned. Thank you. Here's a question from Sue Sparnett. Does any one of you have experience with refugees helping refugees? And how do they fit into the Afghan experience or the Afghan assistance? Anyone? Um, um, so then, oh, go ahead. But no, yeah, I, I, we've had, you know, we've, we've had um, some of our families involved with refugees helping refugees. It's um, a slightly different program. You know, we're there to help and, and create this foundation and refugees helping refugees may go longer term with uh, English classes specifically for women where they can bring their children. They have sewing programs, um, more social benefits. Um, you know, we've got to kind of rely on this brick, brick and mortar. We're going to build that foundation and, and they can deal more with kind of social and emotional needs um, for some of our families that quite honestly, we don't, we don't have the capacity to deal with. Oh, by that, do you want to? Did you want to jump in on that too? So, so I was just going to echo Alan that yes, they uh, they are one of our partners and they do have those classes that they help. So basically, the uh, KOP they help the SIVs primary. So then, so other refugees they can go there. They can go. We have Mary's Place and other uh, partners that they can get additional support like class-wise or socialization on, on those things, yeah. So thank you for, these que for the questions. Thank you for the answers. I see that we have only seven minutes left. So I would love to do our lightning last round. And for the lightning last round, I just want to give each one of you the opportunity to make some final remark, some bit of wisdom that you would like to share or um, a principal involved. And let's switch up the order a little bit. And David, since you are always last, you'll, you will be first this time. I think that my life is significantly richer for my new family and friends. And I am grateful and thankful that they are here in the Rochester community contributing to who we are and our whole magnificent world together. They're a, a fantastic people. And something Obida, Obida said, which really resonated with me, uh, so often Americans are exposed to Islam through our media and they see uh, Arab youth in the streets revolting or uh, acting in a certain way. These are extreme groups. And what I have been introduced to by the Afghan community is the most beautiful, gentle people who are reverent, who are social, who are giving, and who just live their life in a very holy, wonderful way. So it has been a joy and a pleasure to learn from my new friends. Ellen? Yeah, I just, and, and I went quickly to the question section and, and this does need to be addressed because we're facing this in the entire country. Um, our Afghan friends and now some from the Ukraine are here on humanitarian parole. This is a very limited program for these families. For those from Afghanistan, they don't have a lot of time. There's 18 months from now in which they must file for their what's called chief of mission approval or SIV status, or they have to file for asylum. What's, what I wanna stress to this audience tonight, please support the Afghan Adjustment Act. This would allow Afghans who have been in our country for a year under humanitarian parole to get legal permanent residency status. There are not enough attorneys in this country to help everyone on humanitarian parole. They're here, we brought them here, they've been vetted and we need this act. And I, and I beg you, I beg you to please support that. 
Thank you. Obalda? We need your... <laughs> I muted myself back. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Um, so, so refugees, again, so refugees were forced to leave their country. They did not come by choice, right? So they are the net contributors. They're not a burden, right, that we hear. Um, so the U.S. is a land of immigrants, and they welcome everyone. So I am one of, I came as a refugee, and I am giving back, right? My kids, my daughter and my son are pharmacists, so they're giving back. And so I would, um, I would highly recommend for the audience to please, if you haven't met a refugee family, please do so. It will change your life. And please continue your efforts and support at its, at its more important than ever before. And thank you so much. Thank you. And Nabila? Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for hosting this program. As Obaida and Ellen have, and David mentioned, I'm also uh, requesting the audience that everyone deserve a chance. And as Obaida told, we didn't leave our country by our own choice. The life we have had back there, we need many, many more years in US to build it back here. So we need your support. Each immigrant need your support. Please do not leave them alone. They need time, they need chance. Believe that they will give each day or each hour you spend with them and anyhow back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mia. Thank you, Zubera. As, <clears throat> as my friend insisted, I also by myself would like to ask audience to support the refugees, uh, any type of immigrants that they are here, support them. Uh, and as Abida said, if you haven't met them, please do so. Uh, also, I would like to thank my uh, my friends, volunteers, and nonprofit organizations, Ms. Ellen, Obaida, all the friends that they are supporting and they are working very hard over time uh, for the families that they are in need of, uh, in need of help. Uh, I would like to thank them all. So let me end with thanking. First, let me thank the five of you. I thank you for your generosity of spirit, your generosity of time, and the generosity you show by sharing your experiences. You educate us, and now we know better and we know more. So I thank you so very, very much. And I thank each and every member of the audience who was inspired to join us today to learn more. So good night all, and thank you so very much. Thank you.